It's an honor to be up here. Usually in an introduction, you introduce people to each other. This is the BYU audience. Now I'll get to Dr. Norman Yaffe. Uh, most of you have programs, so I will not go over the exciting details of his CV that are summarized here. Dr. Yaffe got his undergraduate degree at Northwestern, his advanced degrees at Yale. He taught for over 20 years at the University of Arizona, and the rest of the time he's being, he taught at the University of Michigan, even though I advised him not to. Uh, I met Norm, I think, in the early 1990s when he was just heading to Michigan, but I had been reading his material long before that. As you see, he's the author of many books and articles. He's written two other books on the topic that he's going to be addressing tonight. In 1988, he co-edited a book called The Collapse of Ancient States with George Colgill, a professor at Arizona State. And he's just recently published the book with Patricia McEnany, Questioning Collapse, Human Resilience, Ecological Vulnerability, and the Aftermath of Empire. Now, Dr. Yaffe's been here for a couple of days. It's been fun to take him to Temple Square and uh, take him across campus and try to give him a little bit of the feel for the Mormon oddness. And so we've been having a great time, and I've been gossiping with him about all the things that I'm interested in. But mostly he tells me I, won't, I can't answer that. I'm going to answer that at the lecture. So I'm all excited to hear what he actually has to say about the collapse of ancient civilizations. As you read on his CV, he's a specialist in the Mesopotamia but he's worked in the Southwest and he's a very good theorist. So I hope we can learn something from the movies and turn off all your cell phones now. If I hear a beep, I'm gonna go find it and throw you out. No, that's, that's all right. Uh, you can use computers, but turn off your cell phones. And if I could urge you to, if you're leaving after the lecture, hurry out and then the rest of us can come up close and have a more intimate question and answer period about how civilizations work and why sometimes they don't. With Dr. Yeah. I am extremely pleased to be here as a shallot lecturer. Can you hear me in the back? If not, start waving and I'll try to speak up. Um, under the auspices of the much admired Department of Anthropology at BYU. And I thank Professor Clark for your generous introduction. As Professor Clark has said, I've been thinking and writing about collapse for a while. And I want to begin by telling you about my own encounters with the subject. I began worrying about the collapse of the dynasty of Hammurabi of Babylon in the first half of the second millennium BC. I followed the careers of bureaucrats and local leadership structures in Mesopotamian cuneiform tablets and I was especially interested in the relations of local communities and their leaders with the state, the bureaucracy of the crown. 
All of that was for my dissertation in Assyriology, studying the languages and history and archaeology of ancient Mesopotamia. I thought that in 1973, when I finished my dissertation, that I was finished with collapse. However, when I started my first job in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Arizona, I began to consider collapse as part of a larger social evolutionary phenomena, as part of larger social evolutionary phenomena, the rise and fall of ancient states in comparative perspective. I published an article on the subject in 1979, and I thought that was the end of my research on collapse. However, I received a long letter from the Mesoamerican archaeologist George Kogel, who was intrigued by that article and wondered uh, whether my perspective shed any light on Mesoamerican uh, civilizations. Our further correspondence led us to organizing a conference on the collapse of ancient states at the School of American Research in Santa Fe, which was published, as John mentioned, in 1988. I thought then that I was through with collapse. However, I began a book on social evolutionary studies on ancient states that included a part on collapse, and that was published in 2005. Certainly, that would be the end of my work on collapse. About a year after that publication, Patricia McEnany, a Maya archaeologist, invited me to a conference on collapse in reference to the work of Jared Diamond's popular book on collapse, and I became a co-editor uh, with uh, Tricia McEnany of that book, which appeared in 2009. And now I've been asked to come to BYU to talk about what else collapse. This interest in collapse that continues is, of course, because of our modern concerns with global warming and environmental destructions of all sorts and how we might make our own modern society more sustainable and resilient so that it doesn't collapse. My adventures with collapse seem destined not to collapse at all. In fact, I've now rethought some fundamental issues and I'm eager to try a few of these out uh, today. Eager might not be the right word, however, since this is an intimidatingly large and informed uh, audience, although perhaps not as formidable as the audience at the 1920 conference in Berlin of unemployed eunuchs who were thrown out of work at the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. <laughs> Much of the interest in collapse in archaeology surrounds Jared Diamond's work. Diamond might be the most famous anthropologist archaeologist on the planet, at least as far as the public is concerned. How many of you have read Diamond, either the book Guns, Germs, and Steel, or Collapse, or seen TV programs with Diamond? So a fair amount. In fact, Diamond is not an archaeologist or an anthropologist. He's an ornithologist a physiologist and geographer. However, he does write a lot better than archaeologists, and he's a great spokesman for archaeological research, which he doesn't do himself and often misunderstands. In some ways, Diamond's views are, however, nicely anthropological. In Guns, Germs, and Steel, he tries to explain why there are differences in the civilizations of the world, some technologically advanced, such as Western Europe, and others not advanced at all, such as Oceania or Native America. This is nothing to do, in Diamond's view, with race, biology, and this view, of course, anthropologists endorse. But it has uh, to do with geography. The West was triumphant because of the kinds of plants and animals that were indigenous in the Near East and then in Europe, and which were domesticable, and which conferred resistance to disease. Native American societies are considered failures in comparison with Europe. 
Now, all of this is not very historical because if you pick an earlier date, the greatest city in the world in 3000 BC was in Iraq. In 1500 BC, the largest city in the world was in China. And in AD 500, the greatest city was in Mexico. And in AD 1500, the greatest empire was in South America. In AD 2500, the greatest cities and the most prosperous nations may not be in the West at all. And anyway, what is failure and success? At least one historian considers the worst century in human history. If we are grading according to wars, suffering, and callous massacres of human beings, it was the 20th century AD. But history is not a report card of success and failure. In Diamond's Collapse, How Societies Choose to Succeed or Fail, he is concerned with global warming and the risks to modern civilizations. Diamond gleans the archaeological literature to show that the world in which we live was not all that different from the past. He subscribes to Santayana's famous dictum, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. If we do not learn from the mistakes of history, we are doomed to repeat them. Since according to Diamond, many civilizations collapse because of environmental mismanagement, we must learn from these collapses. And we must not engineer our own disaster, not make short-term decisions that ignore long-term stability, especially environmental stability. Archaeologists, for archaeologists, there's another quotation that resonates loudly in modern research. It is William Faulkner's claim that the past is never dead, it is not even past. That is, for modern archaeologists, it's not enough to reconstruct the past, trace changes over time, explain why some things happened, um, uh, at least as well as we think they did. For the past really isn't over. But what are archaeologists to do with the present past? Of course, archaeologists do want to get it right. I'll review some cases uh, presented more fully in uh, that McEnany and Yaffe book uh, on uh, collapse to show that Diamond hasn't got it right. But there are other questions that are important. How do we learn from the past? And what do we do with archaeological knowledge in the present? The answers may be surprising. I want to begin with some examples of the undead past in my own area of research, ancient Iraq, Mesopotamia. Um, you can see that ancient Mesopotamia is pretty much the borders of modern Iraq. In the lower part of the map, I don't think it will be possible to follow that small laser point, but there is a site called Lagash. I want to show you some of the finds from Lagash about 2400 BC. Here is an object called the Stela of the Vultures. It shows a large figure. Um, which can be interpreted either as a god, the god of Lagash, or the king Aonatum himself, uh, in this scene holding a net with captives and holding a, a symbol of uh, a mythological bird. Um, and here is a line drawing of this scene um, with the bird and the captives in the net and presumably uh, the god in the chariot and uh, possibly the king in, uh, in front of the chariot. Now it so happens that bird is pretty well known in Mesopotamian literature and indeed we have depictions in gold and lapis lazuli precisely of this magical bird. The bird was defeated by the god of Lagash in a famous myth after which it became the symbol of the king and uh, of the city. 
Now the other side of the stela has this picture of a phalanx of soldiers led by the king. And uh, in the lower part of the slide and in the very upper part, you can see it is inscribed. So we can actually read some of what uh, the king inscribes as to his victory over a neighboring city, uh, which uh, was a leitmotif of the experiences of the kings of Lagash. I show you that particular scene because it has been appropriated in the present. There it is, that phalanx of soldiers with uh, the, one of the most recent rulers of Iraq, Saddam Hussein, who is very happy to say that he is a successor to the glories of the ancient kings of Mesopotamia, the like, kings of ancient Iraq themselves. So is the past dead or is it used for political purposes? Let me show you this map again. Um, more or less in the middle of it is about there. It's a town called Kish. It hasn't been occupied for 2,000 years, but here we see a highway sign saying, turn right to get to Kish. Why in the world would we have a highway sign in a modern Iraqi highway leading to this ancient site? Was it a, just a tourist attraction? Here is the site itself in plan. At around 2500 BC, it was around four uh, kilometers squared with at least 20,000 people. And we know from the archaeology and from the texts also from this period, it could easily claim to be the largest and most powerful city, not only in Mesopotamia, but the world. I want to show you a little of the excavations that occurred. The French excavated the place in 1911 and 1912. They were intending to go back, but World War I interrupted that plan. And from 1923 to 1933, an expedition from the University of Oxford in England and the Chicago Field Museum excavated for 10 years at the site. Up at the very top, you see a a temple from around 600 BC emerging. And as you go down, you go through time back to around 3000 BC when the site was in effect founded. Those are not natural hills. Those are the ruins of Kish. And these are only a small part of the ruins of Kish. It, like all early Mesopotamian cities, is gigantic. And archaeologists have only uncovered easily less than 1% of it. And you can see from the previous slide of the stratigraphic problems of trying to have a large horizontal exposure contemporary buildings at any one time at Kish. Now, on top of that tall mound on the right, there's something that I have no idea what it is. Here is a shot 80 years later of, I think, the same exact place in Kish. And you see there is, again, something on the top of the mound. But we know what that is. It's an American Army bivouac at Kish that used it at uh, 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 the ancient site as a modern military base. And here is a soldier uh, showing you some of the ruins of Kish that have been unexcavated. The Chicago Field Museum, uh, now called the Natural History Museum, is undertaking a project to accumulate and digitize all the artifacts from Kish. This was publicized in the Chicago Tribune. A soldier from Chicago in Iraq saw that and sent that picture to the, Field Muse the Natural History Museum at Chicago, who, uh, uh, and where colleagues sent it on to me. 
Now, in the countryside in modern Iraq, uh, there is hardly any political stability at all. And here is a satellite picture of looting in one small site. You can see bulldozer tracks leading into it, and um, uh, 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 locals are essentially pirating out of economic necessity uh, their own past in order to uh, find tablets uh, and also artifacts that they could sell on the antiquities market. One of the ironies of history might be that that American military bivouac in Kish was in fact protecting it from modern looters. Let me show you some Mesopotamian tablets. Um, these are very early ones uh, as writing was invented around 3200 BC. There were some precursors uh, to writing, but the writing system uh, was invented, it seems, in a moment, as it were. And perhaps even by one person, because as my academic colleagues like to think of it, could you imagine a committee inventing writing? Here is a later tablet in an envelope. Um, we can read people's mail at the distance of uh, uh, 4,000 years. Some of these tablets uh, were written on and then enclosed in a sheath of clay in which uh, the same tablet, the same information was recorded. So if there was a legal challenge, you could break open the envelope and read the, um, the, uh, the, the real tablet uh, that had been enclosed in that clay sheath, that envelope. I was very pleased to see in the Museum of Peoples and Cultures this morning that there are um, about a dozen clay tablets from Mesopotamia in the collections of that uh, very fine museum. Uh, Mesopotamians wrote everything. They wrote letters, they wrote royal inscriptions, they wrote myths, they wrote epics, they wrote lawsuits, they wrote contracts, contracts of sale, rental, marriage, divorce, uh, almost anything you can think of, they wrote on clay. And these clay tablets are incredibly durable. Think of a pot. You might be able to smash it into pieces, but you, it's very hard actually to destroy, and that is so for clay tablets. Now think of our media of communication, paper. That is going to disappear very quickly over time. And think of computer media. That is also going to disappear. So the point is, if you want something to last for a long time, you want to write it on clay. Uh, also, uh, if there is some disaster in, uh, in Provo and the city somehow disappears and is excavated by archaeologists about a thousand years thereafter, they're not going to find any paper. They're not going to find these, anything in the ruins of the library. They're not going to find any computer media tapes or discs or anything like that. But they're going to find about a dozen clay tablets <laughs> in the ruins of the Museum of Peoples and Cultures. And they may conclude that Provo was a very far outpost of Mesopotamian civilization. <laughs> I'm going to return to Mesopotamia, the area I know best, or at least have the most images of, a little bit later. But I want to review for you some of the case studies in the Questioning Collapse book with a few other observations to talk about um, the theme of collapse. Whoops. First, no. First, I'm going to uh, the Pacific. Um, I have a colleague who works in Oceania, and he shows such a slide at the start of his lectures. He says, this is my field area. It's half the globe. And I'm going to talk about Easter Island. You can see the arrow in the lower right pointing to Easter Island. Um, here is a bit of a map showing how Easter Island was settled from the west at around 1200 A.D. Easter Island is the island that is the, the most distant from any other occupied place 
on Earth. It is 3,000 kilometers west of Chile, which uh, is the government of Easter Island, and it's 2,000 kilometers away from, sorry, from Pitcairn Islands. You can see the closest islands next to Eastern Island. This is Jared Diamond's most dramatic case of collapse as engineered destruction by the people who lived on Easter Island, or Rapa Nui, as it's called in the language of Easter Island itself. Now, these are the most famous artifacts from Easter Island, these very large um, monuments called Moai. And for Diamond, the issue is that Easter Islanders deforested their island and this led to ecocide, as he puts it, and cultural collapse. To quote Diamond, in just a few centuries, the people of Easter Island wiped out their forest, drove their plants and animals to extinction, saw their complex society spiral into chaos and cannibalism. In case anybody misses the point, are we about to follow their lead by destroying our environment? Well, indeed, the paleobotanical research on Easter Island shows that it was, in fact, deforested. And that had implications for those large carved monuments, these moai, some of which are 10 meters high, weigh up to five tons. The point is that some of these trees, this palm forest, were cut down in order to use them as rollers or sleds to bring the moai from where they were quarried to the place where they were erected in that monumental way. And here is Rapa Nui, Easter Island, uh, today. Uh, indeed, the place was deforested. For Diamond, as he puts it, what was the islander thinking of when he cut down the last tree? Well, Easter Islanders are Polynesians. That were, they were farmers. They brought plants from other regions, cultivated them, and they certainly cut down and burned forests as part of agricultural practices, the same as the English did on the American East Coast. They cut down forests in order to plant things. There was something else brought by the Easter Islanders in their migration to Easter Island. They probably came from um, the Marquesa Islands. There are some cultural items and the language itself of the Marquesa Islands about 2,000 kilometers away related to the language of Rapa Nui. They brought rats. Either they brought them as food or they were stowaways on boats. And indeed, we saw a clipper ship at Temple Square the other day, uh, which if you look in the rafters, you saw rats. Uh, rats are very good at getting transported on boats. Here is one of the favorite foods of the rats, a palm nut. Every palm nut that is found in archaeological context is gnawed, as you see those gnaw marks on the top of the palm nut. It is suggested that the rat population was explosive in Rapa, Rapa Nui. Within a few generations, there were millions of rats feasting on palm nuts. And this, according to Terry Hunt, professor at the University of Hawaii, is the most important part in the deforestation of Rapa Nui. Once those nuts were eaten, the palm trees could not regenerate. In fact, the population growth is estimated, always a tricky thing to do in archaeological contexts, at uh, Rapa Nui as growing fairly steadily, then leveling off at under 4,500 people until 1722. What happened in 1722? A Dutch ship 
landed on Easter Island and consorting with the local Rapa Nuians uh, uh, led to a transmission of European diseases and an enormous demographic catastrophe for Rapa Nuians. If we talk about collapse, it is because of European contact. Now, Terry Hunt, this is a slide from him, the Hawaii professor, talks about uh, this is not ecocide, as Diamond put it, but genocide. This is, I think, the wrong use of the term genocide, but he is uh, very dramatically using the term to show that it wasn't Easter Islanders who caused their own collapse, as Diamond had it, but it was because of European contact. I now want to say a few words about Maya uh, collapses. I do so with uh, trepidation. BYU, as you probably know, is one of the foremost institutions in the world in the study of the ancient Maya. And a good deal of, about, of what I'm about to say comes from my reading of BYU scholars. And I can only hope that I haven't screwed it up. This is, a, of course, a scene, an advertisement for Mel Gibson's picture, Apocalypto. The film shows um, a Maya war, basically, where Maya, one Maya city takes captives, um, engages in human sacrifices, and behaves in general despicably, uh, all of which somehow doesn't seem to endear the film to Maya archaeologists. I'm not sure why, since they know that the Maya did precisely those sorts of things. For Gibson, the whole point of the film is to say that uh, Europeans and Christianity saved the Maya from their own bad behavior. Here is the opposite view of the Maya. The Maya are kind of favorites for projecting uh, strange behaviors, and this is the Star Wars view of uh, Tikal, uh, uh, probably the best known of the classic Maya uh, cities, where, uh, uh, the, uh, and this is appeals to New Agers who uh, kind of hold the old views uh, no longer accepted by scholars that the Maya were really peaceful philosophers and astronomers who contemplated the heavens and may even have some relation to people from outer space. Uh, here is a map of classic Maya sites, so from around 200 to 900 or so. I simply want to point out that there is a distinction between the central area, uh, more or less the Peten province in Guatemala, and the northern area, more or less the Yucatan Peninsula of today's uh, Mexico. Uh, here is a scene at Tikal that I'm going to return to a bit later just to give you an idea of pyramids and ceremonial places. And here is a stela from the site of Copan in Honduras, in fact. But here is, a, 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 those are in the central area, that Peten state. Here we're up in the north now at Chichen Itza, where there's something that looks like a good classic Maya pyramid. But there are also constructions at Chichen of buildings um, uh, which are not Maya at all, but are Mexican, Toltec, if you want. So when one talks about the collapse of Maya cities, uh, which is clear, it happened over uh, a you know, in Maya cities over uh, uh, decades or a hundred or so years, these may well have been done, uh, have occurred as a, a result of droughts, increased volcanic activity. That's an, the newest theory I've been reading about. And not least, the over centralized and expensive Maya religion that required much support in labor and resources from the countryside. The last word about the Maya collapse has certainly not been written. But one thing you can say about the Maya is that they didn't choose to fail. There are still about 8 million Maya living today in 
Guatemala, Belize, and Mexico. And historically, the Maya were the last people to be conquered in the region by the Spanish. And indeed, some Maya are still fighting governments in the region today. In this last Maya image, another reprise of Tikal, what I want to point out is especially that pit at the base of the pyramid. It's not an ancient installation at all. It's a modern fire pit, as the modern Maya who live in and around Tikal celebrate their own history before the ruins of their uh, past. In other words, they are connecting the modern Maya with their ancient uh, descendants who built these amazing cities. This is a point I want to return to in a bit, but right now I want to emphasize that when we talk about collapse or we question collapse, we must discuss how ideologies and belief systems in the past can be and were malleable as the example of the persistence of Maya culture has been. In the case of Chichen and other northern cities, by amalgamating Maya culture with Mexican culture, cities were an, uh, persist, persisted, uh, whereas other cities that did not change uh, didn't. Moving to the American Southwest, I want to show a picture of Chaco Canyon, which is in northern and uh, western New Mexico. That's it up there. From about AD 800 to 1125, thereabouts, there were a number of Pueblo like structures that dotted this Chaco Canyon area in an unprecedented concentration of buildings uh, uh, in southwestern prehistory. Either before the time of Chaco or after the time of Chaco, there was no such concentration of buildings such as in Chaco. Here are a number of plans of great houses um, that existed at Chaco. And here is an overhead view of Pueblo Bonito. You, there, okay, sorry. Uh, there it is in plan in the upper right hand part of the slide. There it is overhead, and you can see hair trigger. Just up the canyon, another of the great houses, uh, uh, and there were 14. Uh, altogether of these um, uh, contemporary large structures. Okay. That is uh, uh, Pueblo Benito again, which was reconstructed in part. It's at the height five stories tall. There are lots and lots of rooms and there are lots of round buildings, some of which might have been ritual structures. Now, the story of Chaco Canyon is very complicated. It seems to have been a pilgrimage site. There were very few people who actually lived in Chaco Canyon, and most of those great houses don't have any domestic uh, facilities, no hearths, cooking uh, features, and so forth. And in Chaco, uh, the Chaco phenomenon included not just all these buildings in Chaco Canyon, but many outlying settlements ranging over 100 kilometers that use the same kind of architecture um, as Chaco Canyon. And some of these settlements had roads, ceremonial type roads that led in the direction of Chaco Canyon from their own uh, living pueblos. So there was something big going on in Chaco Canyon that united culturally a large swath of the Four Corners region in the southwest between 800 and 1150 or so AD. Now there were leaders at Chaco Canyon. There was wealth of a sort in Chaco Canyon. And there were long distance connections of Chacoans with people near and far, including um, trade uh, with distant regions in Mesoamerica because macaws 
that only grow in southern Mexico were found in Chaco, and chocolate uh, that also comes from southern Mexico has recently been identified in Chaco Canyon. It seems that people from all over the Four Corners region traveled to Chaco in summers for ceremonies that connected them in a Chacoan belief system. It was something like the Vatican of the Southwest. And in this slide, you see one of the largest, the largest actually, ceremonial structure in Chaco. And in this sign, that structure, Casa Rinconada, is considered by modern Pueblo Indians to be an ancestral site. Their identity is bound up in some ways with ancient Chaco Canyon. Now, no man-made environmental catastrophe brought Chaco to an end, as Diamond alludes. Part of the reason was climate change, a decades-long drought in the 12th century, after which Chaco was abandoned. But an important part of this collapse was the failure of the Chacoan belief system, the system that held all this region of Chaco together. How do we know this? We have oral histories from modern Puebloans who tell their stories about Chaco, and we have archaeological artifacts, ritual uh, artifacts, that show the kinds of changes that occurred after the collapse of Chaco. And archaeologists today take these oral histories of modern Native Americans very seriously indeed. These oral histories relate how people in previous times, meaning Chaco, overstepped the boundaries set by the gods, and the gods thus abandoned Chaco. After Chaco, and some new settlements arose fairly quickly, a few of them in imitation of the great houses of Chaco, but many new settlements were established, a new belief system arose, and a system that opposed the grandiose aspirations of the leaders of Chaco. Here is just a map of some modern Pueblo communities, many of which have stories about a previous world that looks like Chaco. And here is a Katsina doll. It's made by Hopis, and used, at least this one is, used to teach children about the supernatural universe. And this system of katsinas was created around 1300 AD, not from nothing, but with much symbolism that was in fact invented and was very, very different than Chaco. I have to tell you the story that I was at a site called Homolovi near Winslow, Arizona, which the Hopi regard as an ancestral site and which dates to a little bit before 1300 AD, at least some of the sites that Homolovi do. I was visiting colleagues from the University of Arizona who were excavating at the site. And as I was visiting, a cache of objects was found. And the archaeologists called over a couple of teenage Hopis who were working uh, at the site with the archaeologists. And the young Hopi said, that as one thing came out of the ground, I know what that is. That's a something or other. Uh, but he, he said then, but that's very strange because this something or other always goes with this other thing. Five minutes later, the other thing came out of the ground. This is a site that is 700 years before uh, these modern Hopis in their beliefs, but it was invented then, and it's part of the Hopi belief system today. And there are other sites, too, and other finds that have been excavated in the 12th century uh, A.D., in which modern Pueblo Indians can interpret very well because it's part of their belief system today. So what was invented after Chaco Canyon um, is essentially the uh, belief system that works in Pueblos about today. Well, what's the point about talking of, about the collapse of Chaco? Yes, the great houses were abandoned, and we can study drought and failures of leadership and so forth. But I think it's far more interesting and certainly more important 
to tell the story of Native American survival, resilience, adaptability, and the construction of more sustainable societies. And maybe we should even be talking about heroism, especially if we extend the story to experiences with European and American invaders in the Southwest. I now want to return to Mesopotamia with an example of collapse that has nothing to do with environmental mismanagement and failure. And indeed, it's a story about the ironies of political success. I'm going to tell you the story only in outline, of course. But fortunately, you have experts on ancient Mesopotamia at BYU. And you can go to them and hear the rest of the story, as uh, Paul, what's his name? Paul Harvey used to say. Thank you. I pointed to, out to you the southern cities of Lagash and Kish in the very south here. And now I'm going to talk about the north, which is ancient Assyria. Uh, it's called Assyria after one of its capitals, Ashur, and also the national deity who is called Ashur. Now also on this map, note the site of Kanesh, which is way off in more or less the middle of Turkey, which we call the Asiatic part we call Anatolia. I want to start out by talking about the old Assyrian period, which is a period we know mainly from trade. And here are some of the trade routes from Ashur in northern Iraq to Kanesh and to other uh, places in Anatolia that were like Kanesh. In fact, Kanesh was a trade colony set up by the Assyrians near a larger Anatolian site. But it was a colony without colonialism, since the Assyrians lived in Anatolia under the suffrage of Anatolian rulers. They didn't conquer the place. They were just trading with it. Now, Assyrians took donkey caravans from Ashur to Anatolia and other outposts. They traded tin, which is needed for the production of bronze, and textiles uh, and, uh, for silver and gold, which were plentiful in Anatolia. Uh, and the people who traded were entrepreneurs. This was not state-controlled trade, but these were people who made money on long-distance trade, moving materials from where they were plentiful to where they were scarce. But it's not economics I want to talk about today. In old Assyrian society, there were kings, definitely. But there were other people involved in governmental affairs in Assyria. There, were, there was, for example, a city hall. And there were assemblies or councils of big men and small men, as the text reported. And the system of dating in Assyria was after important people, uh, not kings and their lieutenants in the land. In brief, there was a kind of sharing of power. And this hierarchy attempts to explain how that worked. There was a palace, and there were kings, but there were also councils and nobles, as well as a temple administration. All of that, those people were Assyrians. That changed in the middle Assyrian period. We find that kings have a great deal more power because they were, at the start of the period, fighting neighbors for their own independence. And in order to do so, they centralized their state. We don't read of assemblies anymore. And we do read of new importance of the army, which had initially uh, freed the Assyrians from their neighbors whom they were fighting. Um, uh, but turned into a military force for expansion soon thereafter. One Assyrian king, Tukulti Ninurta, built a new capital. And we read that he was assassinated for this act of hubris by the nobility in Assyria, which still existed, but was in the process of being disenfranchised by the king's own nobles and army officers. So this is an attempt to depict the middle Assyrian hierarchy, let us say around 1300 BC. The old Assyrians were around 1800 BC. 
and you see that the Neo-Assyrian society was hierarchized more or less directly under the authority of the palace, although there were nobles and gentry who could rise up to resist policies of the king. Now we go to the Neo-Assyrian period where the Assyrian army is triumphant. The Assyrians conquer most of the ancient Near East all the way into Egypt. And they build new capitals. The new bureaucrats are officers of the army. They are granted large lands uh, for their new ranks. And they have new people to work these kinds of lands. Um, here are a couple of images of door bowls you may have seen and one of the capitals, new capitals that had to be built freshly in the Neo-Assyrian period as the new palace of a newly uh, and immensely strong king. This is what the Assyrian hierarchy um, hypothetically looked like. Uh, the king and the palace were, were at the top. The army and the generals were increasingly important bureaucrats. New capitals were built. And if you notice at the bottom, um, uh, many of the laborers on these new capitals were people that the Assyrians had defeated in battle. Perhaps the most famous episode of people that the Assyrians had uh, subjugated and then deported as laborers to build capitals and to work on estates were the tribes of Israel. The, Israel, the, the king of Israel refused to pay tribute to the Assyrian army. He came down, defeated them and their capital, Samaria, and we read in the text of the tens of thousands of people who were deported in 722 BC by the king Sargon II into the Assyrian heartland to work on those new capitals and to be field laborers. The old line nobility in Assyria had been eradicated. The countryside consisted of large lands that were given to generals and high bureaucrats. The people who worked this land and who were the majority in Assyrian capitals were not Assyrians, did not share Assyrian culture, did not speak the Assyrian language, mainly spoke Aramaic, um, uh, and came from the areas that Assyria had conquered. When the Assyrian army was defeated by old and new enemies in 614 through 610 uh, BC, there was no regeneration from this collapse, as we had seen in these previous regenerations. The urban capitals lay in ruins, and the top levels of this hierarchy had been removed as part of the collapse. Indeed, the only things left were the lower end of the hierarchy, villages which were populated by non-Assyrians. So the answer to why the Assyrian state did not regenerate was that the very success of Assyrian rulers had destroyed the basis of Assyrian culture. The elimination of the nobility and merchant classes in order to become a more efficient military state finally resulted in the submersion of their own culture. But history offers no assurance of finality. What, um, there was no environmental destruction, and it was the policies of successful Assyrian kings that had destroyed their, uh, uh, their own culture. But is this collapse total? Here in Chicago is a monument, it says, in memoriam of Assyrian martyrs. Since some descendants of those Aramaic speakers that had been deported to Assyria converted to Christianity and eventually formed the Church of the East, not part of the Roman Church, but of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Today, however, they call themselves Assyrians and their church, the Assyrian Church, because they're proud of their relation to ancient Assyria, even though their beliefs and languages have little to do with historic uh, ancient Assyria. Well, let me try to wrap all of this up. First, 
the past is not dead. This is already well known. It is, the past is used by politicians for their own purposes, as I showed in a couple of slides in Mesopotamia, but could tell such stories from all over the world. Also, modern identities are inextricably tied to their understandings of the past, and these understandings have been created by archaeologists. No one knew about Assyria before archaeologists in the 19th century brought the civilization to life. There were a few odd references, of course, about Assyria in the Hebrew Bible and in Greek histories, but these were often uh, very garbled, as we know from reading the original documents from the land themselves. So archaeologists are the midwives of memory, conferring the power of the past to live again. Second, there is a responsibility for archaeologists to get things right, at least to make sure that the data are analyzed and ordered as best we can. Pyramids were not built by aliens from outer space and collapses were not caused by people ruining their environments. Diamond's story is a fairy tale of the past. The new element in the responsibilities of archaeologists to work with the descendants of ancient people looms ever larger for modern archaeologists as we learn from them, as well as sharing our knowledge of the past with them. Third, it is clear that Diamond and archaeologists concerned with global warming are concerned with global warming uh, uh, and environmental management. Archaeologists are just as concerned about these things as Jared Diamond. But it is the case that ancient people did not have the capability of destroying their entire environments, although humans certainly did alter their environments, sometimes enormously. It was simply impossible for humans to affect their environments in the scale we can do so today. The warnings about global environmental change are not that we are going to suffer the same fate as ancient civilizations, because there is no precedent for the kinds of environmental destructions we face today. And this is all the more reason to take action in our day. Fourth, the history of ancient states shows that we can appreciate the long course of humans who solved problems in the past and still survive today. We have many examples of people who learn to change their ways. The challenges ahead for us are profound and require inspired problem solving and human resilience. It may be optimistic, but one can hope that our leaders and people across the globe are now responding to the challenges we have before us. Fifth and finally, the entire problem of collapse has perhaps been falsely conceived by popular writers like Jared Diamond, but also many archaeologists. Collapse tends to imply that ancient states were relatively stable and well-governed, with leaders who understood their societies. Nothing seems further from the truth. Collapse was not an exception to the rule of stability. And to explain collapse, we must find stresses and unusual conditions either external like climatic change or internal like resistance to unjust rule. Ancient states, all of them, were rather unstable, ramshackle, and always changing. Dynasties fell. Various social and ethnic groups struggled for power. Enemies appeared who were themselves on the periphery of ancient states and who alternately at, at, were attacked by the armies of those states or were lured by the wealth of states with which they came into contact. In archaeology, we often speak of the evolution of complex societies, meaning the evolution of states and state-like societies. Perhaps we should change our perspective 180 degrees and discuss, rather, the evolution of fragility. Collapse certainly would look very different if we did. Thank you.